I uh, heard the brother say that uh, I sometimes go by another name, uh, which was a suggestion of a number of people. Uh, there was nothing wrong with my name in the first place, but uh, I do sometimes go by another name, but most often I don't, and it has had some interesting results in that in the United States in particular, very often you have uh, church groups which approach the Muslim students at uh, university campuses and they tell them, we'd like to have a debate or a dialogue or a discussion about Islam and Christianity, so why don't you invite a Muslim speaker and uh, we'll bring a Christian speaker and we'll have a discussion. So what usually happens is uh, those brothers uh, get in touch with me and when it comes down to a few days before the debate is supposed to take place, it has happened over and over, the Christian group says, who is your Muslim speaker going to be? And the brothers say, oh, his name is Miller. And they say, no, 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 that's not fair. We want a Muslim speaker. It's not because they know who I am, uh, maybe the starting group, but uh, it's not because of that. It's because what they want is some foreigner who may stumble through the English language or he may be unaware of certain basic things that everybody knows and so they make a fool of him. That's what they want. And it really makes them nervous when they find out, no, his name is Miller. Uh, he comes from this continent. <laughs> Usually what they say is, that's not fair. In fact, recently a situation like this came up in Kansas at the University in Lawrence and they wanted two speakers and they told the Muslims, you bring two speakers. Well, there was myself and another brother whose name is Steve Johnson. He used to be a Jesuit priest. And again, they were very upset about that. They thought that wasn't fair. In one situation in Pennsylvania, at the last minute, the Christian group became so worried that they canceled their speaker and they brought in an Egyptian Christian because they thought maybe that would counteract the effect of having a North American talk about Islam but that Egyptian Christian made all the mistakes they were hoping the Muslim would make <laughs> he barely spoke English and he was very unaware of certain basic things in fact the organizers came to the Juma the next day after this talk and apologized for the performance of their speaker. Now I mention all of that because it leads into really the topic that's under discussion. The Muslim is supposed to be equipped to give an account of himself. He's supposed to be able to defend what he believes. It used to be Muslims were much better equipped for that. But as the boundaries of Islamic territory spread out, in the center, the Muslim didn't have much contact with the non-Muslim. So he didn't get any exercise in defending what he believes in. He's surrounded by people who never challenge him. It's on the frontier, on the edge, in the new territory, where the Muslim has to be sharp. He has to be aware of how to deal with people that he meets. A few years ago, a brother had brought to me a little booklet, it was in Arabic. Somebody had given it to him, and he was very excited about it. He said, look here what I found. And he started going through, and he is quickly translating through the Arabic. He's from Sudan himself. He said, this was written by a man in Syria. It's about Christianity. It's a Muslim writing about Christianity. And look at all these arguments that he uses. He says, he uses your arguments. He quotes the same place in the Bible you quote. He says the same thing you say here and here and here. And he was turning the pages and translating. So I said, when did he write this? I was very happy about this. But there's a man in Syria who's writing in Arabic about the same kinds of things I'm talking about. Well, he hadn't thought about that. He hadn't even noticed who the author was. He just had noticed that he was from Syria. So he looked again on the inside, on in the cover, and this was a reprint of a book that was 800 years old. It was written that long ago when there were Muslims who used to deal directly with the non-Muslim. 
that's a rare thing to find today, at least in that part of the world. And that's a shame. In the situation you're in here, really you have plenty of contact with the non-Muslim. You can't just build a wall around yourself. You have to be equipped to deal with the person on the outside. Or in fact, uh, you're only going to uh, suffocate yourself. You're, you're going to defeat your own uh, community because you get no exercise. It's like muscles you don't use, and the brain is the same way. If you don't use it, it dries up. So I'm suggesting in dealing with a thing called revelation, reason, that it's something that requires thinking and practice, and we should be ready to talk about these things. I'm afraid that it's sometimes a controversial subject. Uh, there are Muslims who say reason has nothing to do with revelation. And that too is a shame because that's very much in disagreement with what the Quran tells us. As we find several ayat that tell us the Quran is for those who have understanding. It's meant to be understood. If you don't understand it, then you have a problem. It's supposed to be understood. It's a revelation. What does the word even mean in English? It means you revealed, it means unveiled. Something was covered and it's uncovered here is the truth. That's what revelation is. It's showing you something you didn't know. So you have to have an understanding. It's not meant to just be something that has a great deal of blessing just wrapped up in the sound it makes when somebody recites it. There's a message there as well. The sound is beautiful, but it means something also. A friend of mine is, by birth, uh, a Palestinian, so he's spoken Arabic all his life. He said he was in Europe one time and he was sitting in a mosque and he heard a man beside him saying something very fast. And he listened, he listened, he couldn't figure out what he's saying. He heard this... He finally stopped and asked him, he said, what is that noise you're making? He said, I'm reciting the Quran. My friend says, listen, I speak Arabic. I'm telling you, I didn't even know it was Arabic. Slow down. He says, no, no, the faster I say it, the more times I can recite the Quran. I get to the end and I start over. Well, he suggested to him that <laughs> it's not how many times did you recite the Quran, it's how much time did you spend in reciting the Quran. So understand it. He tried to explain that to him very carefully, and when he finished, the man just started up again at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> There's supposed to be some meaning in there. That's not to say everybody understands everything that's in the Quran, but the idea is it's trying to tell you something. And if somebody tells you that it's too difficult for you to understand, I suggest that's a very un-Islamic thing to say. Who knows best how to talk to a man? but the one who made man. People who tell you the Quran is too difficult are saying, well, God wants to talk to you, but only a few people can understand him. I will tell you what he meant to say. I can understand him, and I'll explain it to you. See, we need teachers, but we don't need interpreters. Nobody interprets the Quran. You teach the Quran. Just as if you go to school, people teach mathematics. They don't interpret it. They teach it. They explain it to you. That's what the writers of Tafsir did. They said, do you have a problem understanding this ayah? Well, look at this ayah, and this one, and this one. And you know this, and you know that. Put them all together now, you see. It's clear. That's teaching. Interpreting is when you say, the real meaning is a secret. I know the secret. I will tell you the secret. That's interpreting. And there's none of that in Islam. Again, as I say, it doesn't mean we understand everything that's in the Quran, but the idea is it can be understood. It may involve some work. But nobody has some kind of a license that he carries in his pocket to say, I am one of the people certified to tell you the secret meanings of the Quran. We're warned about that kind of thing. I hope that's clear because sometimes that causes the, the controversy. There is a difference between a teacher and an interpreter teacher assembles the facts and he helps you learn it. An interpreter says, don't try to learn it. I'll tell you. Trust me. And that's the danger. We have even the case of uh, Omar when he was the Khalid. 
who issued a law. He said such and such will be the case and a woman challenged him and said, how can you say that when the ayah says, and she quoted the Quran to him. And what did he say? Did he say, don't argue with me, I'm the Khalif. He didn't say that. He thought about what she said and then he announced to everyone, the woman is right, Omar is wrong. What anybody tells you has to stand on its own merits, not on the merits of who is he, but how much sense does he make. So the idea is to keep your mind alert, not to go to sleep and let somebody put great burdens on you and say, believe this and take this and so on. I know all about it, so trust me. You're supposed to process that information, to give it some consideration. Then you come to trust the right people. If you test what people tell you often enough, you start to realize, this man, I think I can trust him because ten times he's been right. I'm starting to trust him. This one I'm suspicious of. Then you make some progress. There is, you see, a, this feature of Islam which liberates, it makes people free, which virtually no religious system has other than Islam. It's liberating in this way that one of the messages to the reader of the Quran is an encouragement that you should trust yourself to know truth when you hear it. Trust yourself to know the difference between true and false. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, but the idea is that you have the ability to discover the difference between true and false. You may make mistakes, but carry on. You can find the difference between true and false. You can't be sincerely wrong for your whole life. If you want the truth, you'll find the truth. You have that ability. You don't find that in most religious systems because, in fact, they will tell you that the truth, is, when it comes to religion, is a thing you just have to accept. Somebody gives it to you and you take it. Don't try to analyze it to take it apart. And they defeat themselves in this. You see, the Quran wants you to analyze what you hear. It tells you to analyze the book you're reading when you read the Quran. Don't just take it because somebody said you should, but think about it. Isn't it so? It asks you again and again, Oh man, haven't you considered this? Can you not see this must be true? Again and again in many, many points. Saying, you know this and you know this, so you must admit this. That's analysis. In English, uh, those, uh, the word comes from two Greek words. Anna from the, means up and uh, lysis or lies, almost like it sounds in English, means loose. When you analyze something, it means you loosen it up. So you, you open up the package and you look at all the parts. You don't just swallow the whole thing. You loosen it up to see, does this connect with this? And is this sound? Is this true? You analyze it. Just a few months ago, I was in uh, Kuala Lumpur and there was a missionary who had come to one of the talks that I gave. And I explained the kind of thing that I've been talking about here. And he stood up to say, in the question period, he said, no, when it comes to religion, you can't analyze. He says, the mind cannot tell the difference between true and false. He says, you have to be like the gold coin dealer. And he tells a nice story. He says, men who make their living dealing in gold coins can tell the difference between a gold coin and one that has lead added to the gold by the sound it makes when they drop it on the table. The gold coin dealer will take a coin. If he has never seen it before, he may bite it. He drops it on the table. He says, ah, this has a little bit of lead in it. It's not pure gold. He says, that's the way truth is. It comes from the heart. Can't explain how, but when you hear it, you know it. Well, his problem is, the gold coin dealer doesn't do this trick by magic. He does it by analysis. It's years of experience that have taught him when you throw a piece of lead on the table, it goes plop. And when you throw a piece of gold on the table, it goes ding. That's analysis. He knows that by sense. It's not by some magic gift he has. He learned that by experience. So what he didn't seem to realize is that the method he's talking about is my method. He doesn't understand how the gold coin dealer works. 
you're supposed to learn over the period of your life how to tell the difference between true and false so you don't fall for the lies that people tell it's also unfortunately true that as human beings anytime we hear a new thing a strange thing we're not likely to believe it but what often happens is if we hear it several times then we start to believe it because it doesn't sound strange anymore we've heard it before so we start to believe it as some people have said if you repeat a thing often enough then people believe it it may have been false to start with but keep saying it keep saying it and finally people will start to believe it that's unfortunately true so it's one of the things we want to ask ourselves if we're trying to defend what we believe in we want to ask why do I believe it anyway is it because I've heard it so many times or do I have a reason to believe it if you believe it because you've heard it many times then you're never going to be able to convince somebody else unless it's just by repeating it to him over and over but what most people want is a reason to believe something so it is that in fact many things that people believe are not believed because of reasons they have they don't so much believe things as they give excuses for why they believe what they believe uh, that is uh, somebody may tell you some strange sounding thing as part of his religion and when you say how can you believe that you say well doesn't it sound like it might be true and he tells it to you in a beautiful way and when he's finished the beauty of the story is supposed to convince you that it might be true in fact they have a song about it that some uh, some churches sing <laughs> where they sing I love to tell the old old story which means even if you've heard it I love to tell it over and over and over and I can tell it better than he can tell it so that I meet this kind of thing very often when I get into discussion with people and they'll tell me what they believe and I say how can you believe that he says well, well once more let me explain it and he gives a beautiful explanation of how it's supposed to work and I tell him you've just told me how it works you haven't told me why it must be true then his friend will say no 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 wait let me do it <laughs> so he tells you the story only he puts it in bitter words some people want to sing it to you and they say the more beautiful the telling the more likely you are maybe to believe it but the Muslim is supposed to be alerted to that thing see that was one of the things the Meccans first challenged when the Quran was revealed yes, thank you. the Meccans were suggesting maybe all that is is beautiful words this man is a poet he's trying to get you to believe something because he tells it so nicely and so that is replied to in the Quran to say this is more than the words of a poet because and gives many reasons why it's not the form that does the convincing it's the content what does it say that is supposed to convince you not how nice does it sound when we say it there's also among the uh, the suggestions made by people I'm not picking on a particular group but it's what I'm most familiar with uh, the Christian in particular will say to the Muslim I may believe in a lot of strange things but uh, your problem is you can't make enough room in your mind for this so if you just make enough room to accept some of the things that I say you're being narrow minded you're too cautious make room be generous admit that maybe this could be so they tell us that and they say that over and over in such a way that it wants to make you ashamed of yourself as though well maybe I should give him the benefit of the doubt maybe I should find a place for that in my mind and say, maybe that could be true and yet if you think about it imagine if you could that the situation was reversed suppose it was Muslims who believed in the Trinity suppose it was Muslims who say once there was a man who also was God once there was an infinite being who used to be only that tall and so on 
And suppose it was the Christians who said, no, no, God is one. He could never squeeze himself into a body. And so on. Suppose that was the situation. Then how generous do you suppose the Christians would be with the Muslims? I suggest it's very likely what you'd be hearing all the time from the Christian is, look, you foolish people. Can't you see this doesn't make any sense? And so on and so forth. But because it's the other way around, it is they who tell the Muslim, don't reject this. Maybe it's just too big for your mind to understand. I'm sure they'd, a great many of them really wish it was the other way around, that it was Muslims who had to defend all of these ideas of Trinity and an infinite but finite God, man who died but didn't really die, but he definitely died, but he didn't die, and uh, round and round, this kind of They probably really wish that was our problem, not theirs, but it isn't. Alhamdulillah. Usually when these kinds of things are offered to us to, to try to say, maybe you could find room to believe this anyway, they're offered by way of um, false analogies. That's the kind of thing I talk about with a gold coin. Someone will say, look, you know, it might be true. Maybe it's like such and such and so. I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody said, well, the Trinity is like an egg. You see, you have a shell, and you have a clear part, and you have a yellow part, three parts, one egg. You see, I'd be wealthy if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me that. The problem is, but that's not what the Trinity is like. The Trinity says, the Father is God. He's not one-third of God, He is God. And the Son is God, and the Son, the, the Holy Spirit, is God. But there are not three gods, there's only one God. The difference being, of course, in an egg, the shell is one-third of the egg. It's not the egg. The white is not the egg, the yellow is not the egg. There are thirds. There is nothing that's like the Trinity. There's nothing in nature you can point to and say, you see that thing? That's what the Trinity is. It's like that. There is nothing that comes in three parts, but each part is the whole thing. There's nothing like that. That's what I mean by false analogies. Or appeals to common belief is what it's called, where somebody tells you something is true because look at all the people who believe it. You have two books now written by one missionary worker, this Josh McDowell, two full books trying to show why he's right. And basically, there's a number of mistakes in them, but basically the, the most recurring mistake is that He'll tell you on one page what he believes, and then he'll give you a list of people who say he's right. That doesn't prove anything. 500 years ago, I could have proved to anyone that the earth was flat, if that was the case. So the earth is flat. Go out on the street and ask the first person you meet. He'll tell you, I'm right. The earth is flat. There's the proof. It doesn't matter if the whole human race says something that doesn't make it true unless your argument is the whole human race says this thing, I suppose. But the number of people who agree with you, or even the number who disagree with you, doesn't have anything to do with the truth or the falseness of what you believe. So you can always find somebody who will tell you you're right. You can always find something that makes it look like you might be right, and so you can fool yourself. If I told you the moon was made of cheese, I'm quite sure if you give me seven days, I'll bring you somebody who will tell you I'm right. I can find him here. I probably won't have to walk very far. If I tell you the moon is made of cheese, I can show you things that makes it look like it might be right. You know it's the same color as cheese. Doesn't it look like it might be made of cheese? So you can always find somebody or something to make it look like I might be right. But that's how we fool ourselves. That's why the stress in Islam is on reason. Don't let someone fool you, don't fool yourself. You see, the Quran, by contrast with these kinds of false arguments and imitations of arguments, offers replies to things. There's a tradition that says in Islam there is no, uh, there is no foolish question, if you will, in Islam. There is no question somebody can ask, and the Muslim's reply would be, that's a silly question. There's only good questions. There are some questions where the question is faulty. There's something wrong with the question. 
But there's no foolish question you learn by any question you ask. I have an American uh, Muslim friend who in fact is a Muslim because of that attitude. He was in a church and he used to go and ask his pastor questions all the time. One day the pastor had given a talk saying there's only one God. So he came to him after and he said, how do you know that? Because maybe there's 12 gods, but we forgot 11 of them. The pastor said, that's a foolish question. Tell him, go away. It's a good question. The Quran gives an answer to it. it. tells you in one ayah, if there were many gods, then what you would see would be confusion. Because each god would be trying to take charge of some piece of the creation. You would not see harmony and cooperation. One thing you know for sure is that the universe only has one management. It never changes. The rules stay the same all the time. It's a good question. In fact, the education of the Quran is largely built around quoting all the stupid things that people say and showing you why they are stupid things. It always worries me when I get into a community and people say, we're building a Muslim school. That can be a good idea, but usually you find people who say, what we're going to do is put up a big wall and put our children in there and we'll hide them away from all the lies that people tell. Well, then you're not educating them Islamically. Islamic education means you show the people all the lies people are telling. You show them why they're lies. The Quran quotes every kind of foolishness that anybody ever thought of. That's how it teaches you. It's telling you when you go out on the street, you may meet someone. He'll tell you this. When he does, you tell him that. You don't educate anyone if you hide all of these things from him. You say, the truth is just this. Don't listen to anyone else. You listen to other people and you learn how foolish they are and you come to appreciate what you have more. That's the real education. Islam, then, is really based on a, a number of things that don't require the kind of proof that other people are so concerned about. You know that in the United States, half of the printing that is done that's printing of any kind. Books, newspapers, magazines. Half of the printing done in the United States is done by the evangelical churches. Take all the paper and ink used up in the U.S., half of it is used by those one small group of churches. Now you might think, well, they must have a lot to say then, because they use up half the ink in the U.S. They don't really have very much to say at all. But it's because they are in a position of having to defend so many things which cannot really be defended. It only gets worse. The more they try to patch it up, the worse it gets. That's why you have about 35 English translations of the Bible. Each one was trying to fix up something that the last one messed up. And it, it just gets worse each time. That's, I'm not meaning to ridicule, but that's really what happens. Truth is in agreement with the facts. And if you keep trying to cover up the truth, then you cause some problem in another place. It's just as... Um, you know, this carpet that is laid wall to wall, you find it in some homes where they, it runs from one wall to the other and it's tacked down tightly. Well, you have to measure that the same size as the room, you see. If the piece is too short, you can get it up to this wall and now it won't reach this one. And when you pull, it tears. Uh, or if it's too big, it has a bump in it. When you smooth out this bump, it jumps up in another place. That's the way falsehood is. When you try to cover the truth with something false, there's always going to be a rip or a bump somewhere. So no matter how many times you try and smooth over something you've hidden, it causes a new problem in another place. <laughs> Thinking of a story we had uh, years ago when I lived in the West Coast in Canada. It was a story of a man, uh, a true story, who worked for a, one of the big stores there. His job was installing this carpet. And... Uh, he was in a brand new home and he put in this wall-to-wall -wall carpet and you, you have to tack it down carefully all around the edges so that it's completely tight like the top of a drum. And when he was all finished with this, brand new home, he reached for his cigarettes and they're gone. And he looked back and in the middle of the carpet is a bump. So he figures that's where my cigarettes went. 
it'd take him all day to tear up the carpet and get his cigarettes back. So he took his rubber hammer and he went over and he hammered down this bump, stomped it down, smoothed it out, and he thought no one will ever know the carpet will be here for 20 years. But the cigarettes are smashed flat. And then he went out to his van and there were his cigarettes on the seat. We went back in the house and this woman that owned the place is running around in a panic looking for her budgie bird. So, see the point I'm trying to get at, you try and hide the truth, you make it worse. You may think that you have fixed things, it gets worse. That's the nature of falsehood. Try and use it to cover over the truth, it will find you out. As the Quran says, the truth wins over the false. That's its nature. Because truth is agreement with facts. If you can always make the false agree with the facts, well then it's not false, it's true. You see, the truth wins by what truth is. Now, here I'm afraid, maybe is where I get into some controversy and where sometimes uh, Muslims have some misunderstanding. Listen carefully, please, to what I say. Because some things are impossible. And if you don't believe that, then people will use that against you. you. See, the Quran tells us a number of things that people believe, and it tells us why they can't be true. It doesn't just forbid us from believing them, it tells us why they can't be true. But if you say, oh no, no, you see, with God, anything is possible. Well, then what's the whole point of the Qur'an, if anything is possible? The Qur'an tells you some things are not possible because they don't mean anything. They're just words. It gives the one example as it begins one surah by an oath that says, By the even and the odd. An even number is a number that you can cut into half. It's divisible by two, like four and six and eight are even numbers. Odd numbers, if you try to divide by two, you have one left over. So they are two different things, even and odd numbers. When you say even, you mean it isn't odd. What you mean when you say even. So not even God can make an even number an odd number. Because it doesn't mean anything. If you point to one and say, this is even, what you mean is it can't be odd. It isn't odd, it's even. It's a meaningless string of words to say, oh yes, but God, he's big and strong, he could make an even number into an odd one and it would still be even. No, that doesn't mean anything. It's just empty. You see, hundreds of years ago there was a, a Jew in Europe, a Benedict Spinoza, some call him Baruch Spinoza, I guess. He was a Jew who... Uh, a very clever man and he had given so much thought to philosophical matters that he left the Jewish community he was very disappointed in them and the Christian community came running to him saying now that you've had the good sense to leave the Jews you should be a Christian he said I would if I knew what you were talking about and he just simply his whole life pointed out to them he said, you tell me that God became a man. And I'm asking you, what do you mean? Those are words, but what do you mean? Those words don't mean anything. Do you mean God became a man like once there was God, but then he became a man, so he isn't God anymore, now he's a man. He used to be God, now he's a man. Do you mean like when uh, water becomes ice and it freezes? It used to be a liquid, but then all these atoms squeezed together and formed a crystal, and now we have ice. Is that what you mean? That God was big, but he squeezed himself down. Now he looks like a man. He's made of the same stuff, but he's pressed into shape like a man. Is that what you mean? What do you mean? See, there is no meaning to that when you say God became man. Because of what the words God and became and man mean. That's the kind of thing the Quran talks about. The, the Messiah is not God because of a number of considerations. Things that some Christians have realized over the centuries. 
as a great many non-Trinitarian Christians have always been. 17 centuries ago, a man named Arius thought about it this way, like a thought experiment. He did a, like lab work in his mind. He said, all right, suppose God could be a man and still be God. Suppose you point to someone and say, this is God and this is man. He said, what would happen if I stabbed him? If he's a man, he'll die. If he's God, he won't die. Well, he can't do both. I mean, he either dies or he doesn't. So as Arius put it, and it's really what the Muslim can say to the Christian, in all generosity, he might say, if you want to tell me that Jesus is God, go ahead. But then don't tell me he died. If you want to tell me Jesus died, go ahead. But then don't tell me he was God. You see, for today, I'll give you one. But I can't give you both. <laughs> Nobody can give you both. And their problem is, they demand both. He was God, and he died. So you, you, you can't have both. You can have one or the other, or neither. You can't have both, because it doesn't mean anything. To point to someone and say, this one, he's alive. And he's dead, too. See, when you're alive, then you're not dead. You're dead, you're not alive. It's, 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 these are two different things that exclude each other. I hope I'm not confusing you, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to get at. That's the sort of thing the Quran encourages, to think this way, to say, this can't be so because, look, this and this, it's impossible. Some people will be very happy about that. About the same century as Arius, there was a saint of the church who used to say, why did he believe what he believed? As it translated from the Latin, he said, It is absurd, therefore I believe it. Absurd means silly, crazy. The sillier it is, the truer it is. Now there are people who think that way. They tell you that's what religion is. And if the Muslim doesn't understand that about people, he's never going to be able to communicate with them. To a lot of people, that's what religion is. Everything else makes sense. Religion isn't supposed to make sense. There's been books written about Islam, people criticizing Islam by saying it's nothing more than common sense. As though this was a crime. As they put the phrase sometimes, they say, all theological doctrines are paradoxical. That means, when you talk about theology, you say things that sound crazy. That's what theology is. You talk about astronomy or geology or medicine, you say things that make sense. But when we move over here to theology, it doesn't make sense. That's why we call it theology. That's how some people think. It's supposed to be a collection of impossible things. Things that can't be true, but they must be. If you're brought up to believe that, it puts you in a frame of mind where no one is ever going to convince you away from that. Or it seems unlikely. I've met people time and time again. Or you give them some reply to something to say, look, the thing you say you believe in, it can't be true because A, B, C, you tell them why. And they smile and say, I know, isn't it beautiful? They love it. The more wrong you show them they are, the more they love it. Like, yes, I know. As some people will tell you, I'm a fool. Like, <laughs> in daily life, would you say that to anybody and be happy about it normally? But when it comes to religion, there are people who will tell you that. I am proud to be. Some will say, I'm a fool for Christ. Well, whatever religious scriptures you read, there's a lot said about fools. <laughs> and who is likely to be the fool? But uh, come back to that in a minute. Point is, if the truth about religion is supposed to be impossible sounding things, the problem is, how will you ever decide which is the truth then? You see, some man may come to you and say, let me tell you this, it makes no sense at all. And another man will come and say, no, no, I have something different. It doesn't make sense either. Mine is true, his is false. How do you decide between two things that don't make sense? The only way to judge when something is true is to at least it has to make sense. That doesn't even make it true, but at least it has to make sense. To say, this one I disregard, it doesn't make sense. You see what I mean? Uh, if people have competition between two kinds of nonsense, how do you choose between them? 
to choose between them, you have to use good sense. And yet these things are nonsense. They don't have any sense. What some people will then tell you is that they believe the unbelievable. This is why they have a great reward, which is an interesting idea. People will tell you, the more impossible things I believe, the greater my reward in paradise. That's an interesting idea, but I don't know of any scripture that says that anywhere. That's an idea that some people have made up. I don't know of any scripture where it says this will be impossible, but believe it anyway, you'll have a reward. If you believe, the more silly things you believe, the greater your reward. I don't know of anything that says anything like that. But that's how some people run their lives. And they'll tell you very proudly, they say, I believe what is unbelievable. But what does that sound like somebody saying? By definition, I think if you looked it up in a dictionary, you might find under the word foolishness, you might find in there, a fool is somebody who believes what is unbelievable without any proof. That's being fooled. And in any scripture you read, who is likely to be fooled, the good or the wicked? Who gets fooled in life? The good people or the wicked people? And yet some people will brag to you to say, yes, I'm a fool. I believe foolishness. There's also people who will tell you very profound things and uh, use this by an illustration of a, a Quranic method that is the way to reply to so much of what people say. When somebody tells you something, you take what he said and apply it to what he said. You turn it back on itself. This is like people who tell you, you can't be sure of anything. Lots of people tell you that. You can't be sure of anything. You want to ask them, are you sure? Usually they'll tell you, yes, I'm positive. You can't be sure of anything. I know that for sure. You see that it defeats itself, kills itself. And there's a lot of things, some of these are sayings that people put up on the walls, you know, they hang them up. They look so profound, but if you just take them and turn them on themselves, you see they defeat themselves. In the same way, I'll often meet people who tell you, after I've explained something, they'll say, you've proved what you say, but you know, even proof can fool you. Your proof can fool you. And I usually ask them, are you sure? And I say, look, I can prove it. <laughs> and they get talking, you know, and I, until I let them carry on, but usually... I want to cut them off and say, I just want to remind you that when you're all finished proving this to me, I will remind you what you said when you started. You told me that any proof can be wrong. It can fool you. So if you think you've proved this thing, you might have fooled yourself, according to your idea, not mine. It's, it's a, a useful exercise to, uh, to think about that, that the great percentage of what people tell you, if you just take it, the principle they've talked about, turn that on itself probably it demolishes itself. That often is the case anyway. Another piece of advice uh, in trying to give an account of what you believe back to people that I'd suggest, and that is when you talk about a topic with somebody and you keep asking questions and they keep giving answers, at some point they may give you what sounds like a good answer. Well, that's the time to stop. You might even ask somebody, is that your best answer? They tell you, yes, make a note of it, fine, let's talk another time. On some other occasion, when you talk about some other topic, and you press till the end, and they reach their best answer, make a note of it. The chances are pretty good that this answer can be a good one, and this answer was a good one, but you can't have both. That they conflict with each other. So people may answer any question you give them, but the trick is, do all of their answers form something that hangs together, or does it fall apart? You see, there are people who will tell you, for example, uh, a price must be paid for all sins. If you sin, the price has to be paid. There can't be any other way. But on another day, he'll tell you, God forgives. 
And he never seems to realize, well, does he forgive or does he get paid? And they want to tell you, well, both. But you can't have both. When you forgive somebody, it means you don't get paid. That's what forgiveness means. The man owes me money. I say, the money you owe me is forgiven. I can't now say, oh, give me my money now, after I've forgiven you. In a similar way, if he pays me the money he owes me, I count it and put it in my pocket and say, I forgive you. I've made a joke of forgiveness. You see, if somebody forgives, they don't get paid. If they get paid, they don't forgive. You can have one or the other. You can't have both. That's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. People may finish with this answer one day and this answer on another day, and then you want to remind them, do you remember what you said on Monday? This is Wednesday you said this. Put those two side by side. So you can't have both. More directly to concern to Muslims are another couple of points that I'd like to make. And that is, time and again in the Quran, we find a discussion of what some group of people do in ignorance, or some bad thing they do. Uh, it talks about people who used to cut the ears of cattle, or they'd uh, uh, have certain prohibitions on uh, which meat could be eaten, or inheritance laws, and various things. And when they were challenged about these things to say, where did you get that? Their reply was always, well, this is what we found our fathers doing. And the Quran points out that that's not an argument, that's not an answer. In fact, it mentions in one place that this is a false argument because that's what your fathers used to say. You do this false thing, your fathers used to be asked, why do you do that thing? They say, oh, we found our fathers doing this. It doesn't establish anything. It just puts the blame somewhere else. But if that's not a reason to say, I do this because I found my father doing it, if that's not a reason for unbelievers, it's not a reason for believers either. It's no good being a Muslim, and somebody says, why do you do the things you do? And you say, well, it's my father showed me. It's not a reason. Your father can be a big help to you, but that's not the reason that it's right, because your father did it. Each person is supposed to establish that for himself, to realize and reflect on these things. As one ayah says, when you read the Quran, it says, read some and think about it, and talk about it in groups of two. It says, face to face, talk about what you read with somebody. So it starts to mean something to you and you understand what's going on. You don't just take it because somebody gave it to you. It has to mean something to you so that you really do submit. I had the experience one time in, uh, I was in Los Angeles and a, an Egyptian man was driving me to the airport and he mentioned, as we're driving, he says to me, how long have you, have you been a Muslim? And at that time, I think I told him six years or something like that. He says, oh, longer than me. Uh, see, he's an Egyptian, about 40 years old, and he's been making salah since he was 15, I suppose. But in his own mind, he says, you know, I've only been a Muslim for a couple of years. Because before that, it was just a habit. Until one day he woke up and realized, this is true. It's not just a habit. It's not just something I was handed. It's true. I can prove it. He thought about it. That's when, in his opinion, he said, that's when I really became a Muslim, when I submitted, because I admitted this is true, and those are the false things, and these are the true things. Now, how do you put yourself in that frame of mind? Well, the Quran starts off by telling us, before we get very far at all, right into the second surah, the second ayah, it tells you who this book is for, it tells you it's a guidance, it says, Hudan lil mutaqeen. A guidance for those who have taqwa. So if you don't have taqwa, it's not going to lead you anywhere. What is taqwa? What is this thing you have to have before this book does you any good? Well, taqwa is often misunderstood too. It's translated in English sometimes by piety, which is not a very good translation. Piety maybe was a good translation a long time ago, but piety carries a flavor of uh, this is somebody who he's so religious he never smiles he eats bread and water he walks around with his head down and his hands folded uh, he maybe wears they used to wear hair shirts you know they, they make a shirt with hair on and turn it inside out so the hair would scratch them all day and, uh, these kinds of things that's piety that's not what taqwa is 
taqwa has to do with well it was illustrated in fact as is reported by Omar when somebody asked him what is taqwa and he was trying to draw a picture of it he said taqwa is like a man who has a long flowing robe and he has to walk in between the thorn bushes so he sees the thorn bushes and he thinks about it and then he pulls his clothing in around him and then he walks in among the thorn bushes so he won't catch his clothing taqwa means in other words he's aware of his environment he takes notice of everything around him he's alert he sees which action is called for on every uh, circumstance awake and alert that's taqwa or a shade of its meaning if you have taqwa it means you realize your place that some things are beneath you and some things are above you and you have an understanding for what is your place so you don't reach for the things that aren't yours and you don't lower yourself to the things that are beneath you you deserve better that's taqwa or a start of it but your eyes are always looking around you to think this is a good thing this is a bad thing I'm not sure about this so I'll wait until I decide and so on that's taqwa you're being careful then this book is a guidance for you Huda because it starts to tell you take notice of this and take notice of that and don't forget this it keeps pointing your face at what is important what matters in life because there's a great many things that don't really matter when it comes to certain other things and you might say it doesn't matter if there are men living on Mars I still have to find something to eat tonight whether this is true or not I know I have to do this that's the kind of thing that the Quran is filled with to say if your speculation is here or there you want to tell the story of the crucifixion and how it really happened you're wasting your time what you need to know is this don't waste your time there it keeps telling you which things matter so it is that really intelligent Muslims in every age have not been disturbed by a title that says reason and revelation although some are today and probably always there have been some who were because they've understood what the Quran is as they have put it in different centuries the Quran is beyond reasoning but it's not beyond reason what that means is there is information in the Quran which if you had searched for a lifetime you probably never would have found it but now that you have it it's not unreasonable the Quran doesn't tell you to believe anything you can't believe it doesn't tell you this is impossible but you must believe it it doesn't tell you about anything like that so it's not unreasonable but it's beyond the ability of a man to figure out everything you could discover a lot of things for yourself. Do you know that a few hundred years ago in Europe there was a, a version of the Trinity being preached which wasn't totally accurate according to the church. So they called a council to redefine the Trinity, the Fourth Lateran Council. And when all of the bishops and cardinals, all of the intellects had finished their discussion, they issued a statement in conclusion about what is God you know that that statement well it read like this it said there is a reality which is God it is unique and eternal it neither begets nor was begotten and there is none that can be compared to him does that sound familiar that's the 112th surah of the Quran so their best minds arrived at the conclusion that the Quran tells you so what I'm getting at is you might figure out this or that or the other thing but you never figure out the whole thing it's too big but anything you're given is not unreasonable it will make sense you're not asked to believe something impossible unfortunately usually the first people who tell me that's not true are Muslims <laughs> until you know there's lots of impossible things in the Quran and whenever somebody mentions that to me I always ask them for an example so like which which impossible thing are you thinking of and they always give me the same example they say the resurrection of the dead it's impossible that's what the Meccans used to say that's why the Quran answers them several times. It challenges them, says, do they say the resurrection is impossible? Have they considered this? It mentions as an example, have they considered themselves? What were they? 
They came from a drop so small it couldn't be seen. And the verse goes on to say, which is more remarkable, that they were created from an insignificant drop or that someday all of their bones will be gathered together and they'll be made new again? Which is the more difficult task? So it shows a person who says the resurrection is impossible being kind of foolish. It's not even as difficult as something that we all are witnesses of. There's something more unusual than that that goes on all the time. But it directs your attention to that. To say, the resurrection of the dead may be unfamiliar, maybe you've never seen it, but is it impossible? Consider this. Now does it look impossible? That's the kind of thing that the Quran is you know, quite full of. So I repeat, Muslims are not obliged to believe something that a sensible man would say, that can't be so. There's plenty of room for these things to be so, and in every case the Quran tells you to take notice of something else that reminds you that this is not so strange after all. It's a lot like this, and so on. So that's maybe a, a lot of random thoughts till now. I <laughs> thank you for your time and attention. May Allah guide us always closer to the truth. Alhamdulillah. Unseen is not really a good translation, uh, I suppose, but it means literally what is absent. What you don't have in front of you, you believe in that. Uh, that has, again, nothing to do with reason. You see, you have... Uh, most of us believe in things we've never seen. I believe in electricity. I've never seen it. It goes through the wires, but I've never had a look at it. See, most of us never have. Uh, <laughs> so this is belief in something that's unseen. It's not right in front of me. And that's generally what is being talked about. Uh, a lot of what is talked about in the Quran, for example, is ancient history. And it says there are people who believe in that. They weren't there, they were absent. Or that thing is absent from them. It happened hundreds of years ago, but they believe in that. That still is a reasonable thing. You believe in it for a number of reasonable considerations. That's the advantage the Muslim has over uh, various religious systems in competition. You see, you can... This is one of the blessings of Hajj. That you go there and you see the place where these things happen that you know about. See, by contrast, there was an article in a newspaper in Canada a couple of years ago about Islam. And it gave a lot of explanation and then it mentioned uh, the Kaaba. And their words were, they said, Muslims believe that Muhammad threw idols out of the Kaaba. You see their choice of words? They say, Muslims believe that this is true. The same as Christians believe Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> no, Muslims don't believe this man threw the idols out of the Kaaba. They know it. They can go to the Kaaba and say, this is where he stood. He threw them here. Maybe if you dig, you'll find one. You see? <laughs> it's, it's part of the world we live in. It's anchored in fact. It's not a belief in something that you can't touch. Because you can go to Mecca or Medina and there are people who will tell you, you see, well, the prophet is buried here, uh, there's a wife is buried here and the son is there and so on. It's real. It's not as in most other systems that the, the people will tell you, well, once upon a time, long ago and far away, and we're not sure exactly where, this happened. That, that, that's quite different. That would be belief in the unseen and the unreasonable. But when you believe in something when you weren't present, but you've got all kinds of evidence in front of you that this is the way it happened, that's not unreasonable belief. Okay? Is there... I can hardly hear you from the... How 
Yes, well, this question is the kind of thing I think I've started to get at, uh, mentioned last night, that uh, Muslims are in an embarrassing position because they don't know what to make of the origin of man and where did he come from. And what's tragic about that is that the Quran tells you a little bit about the origin of man and then it gives the command that you're supposed to research it. It should be the case that Muslims are the leaders in researching where did man come from, how did he come to be, the shape he is, and so on. The Quran gives you a few hints, telling you his origin is in this place, between that place and that place, and so on. And then it tells you, research it. You should examine it. Muslims don't. So what they're left with is a situation where other people have done it, and they fall into two camps, and the Muslim wonders, which camp should I join? You don't want to be in either one. One group says, man is a joke. It was an accident. It just happened. It doesn't mean anything. The other group says, no, no. 6,000 years ago, God rolled up his sleeves and he huffed and he puffed and it took him all day and he made a man. And then they offer to the Muslim, which one do you believe? <laughs> you see, when you want to say, neither one, they both sound silly. The, the real truth is somewhere else. Because, and where I'm afraid that often we can get off the track is if, we take what little the Quran says and then we start to fill in the rest with other sources. The Quran says as an example that men were made of one nafs. That's all one nafs. And a lot of Muslims will tell you, well, yes, it's like the Bible says. One day Adam went to sleep and God took out a rib and he made it into a woman. Maybe, but I don't think so. And that's not what the Quran says. It simply tells you men and women are made of one nafs. Now the valuable scientific lesson in that is that that's not what generally the world believed until modern times. That's what most people believed. I mean, that the human race usually was of the opinion that men and women came from different sources. And women were made of this and men were made of that. That's what they, the bulk of humanity believed until recent years. The Quran tells you that it isn't true. Now, whatever it is they're made of, they're made of the same thing, the same nafs. It uses the same expression when it talks about how plants are made. It says they're all made from the same water, same mouth. uses the sentences constructed exactly the same. As you, whatever kind of fruit you eat, you have all different kinds, but they're made of the same water. Those you have man, he's made of the same naps. So then you want to get interested in what is this naps? What's the meaning of it? Uh, so it's a very big uh, subject which Muslims haven't begun to explore. There is a book now uh, out by Maurice Bukayo called What is the Origin of Man? And uh, not that I agree 100% with everything that's in the book, but at least he points out these things to say that there's uh, two very silly ideas around and then the Muslim has all of these other possibilities that he could choose from. And he itemizes uh, some of these things, mentioning all the other possibilities that are allowed for within the Quran. I hope that <laughs> satisfies you. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't directly answer what you're getting at. I'm trying to say it's a question that Muslims are supposed to find out about. But you're not obliged to take one or the other of what's currently offered. Have a look at what does the Quran say. Uh, the Quran does not say that Adam was thrown out of heaven. In fact, it never uses, uh, never says that people are going to heaven anywhere. That's a careless translation in English. It talks about paradise, fear doubts, talks about Jannah, a garden. But heaven is something else. For, for a start, that's just one of the. It's just unfortunate, but that's a. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, that too is uh, a jinn is something that uh, maybe people ought to examine because. Uh, Myself, I found in anything that I've ever tried to figure out from the Quran that usually the, the answer was in the, the origin of the word. What did this word mean originally? Um, see, a, a lot of Arabic words in the Quran are used by Arabs today, but they have new meanings. They don't mean what they meant all those centuries ago. They've acquired other meanings. So if you pursue to the original meaning, you have a clue as to what it means. And that word comes from a root which I believe means uh, hidden or something like this. Uh, so there are those who would say, well, whatever the jinn are, this is somebody we don't see. 
whether that means a man who lives in the hills or it means an invisible spirit or whatever it means I don't know but so far that's all the Quran has said that there are communities that you don't see well that's not too hard to understand <laughs> that could be the case there's probably people living on this planet that no one knows they live there they found some people in uh, the Philippines a few years ago who lived inside an extinct volcano nobody ever knew they were there they never met the outside world and they thought that volcano was the whole world you see so in a sense you might say these seem to be jinn <laughs> they've been hidden from the human race till now that's just one uh, option it may well be at something else because it, uh, the Quran mentions of the jinn apparently being made of something different than what man is made of well maybe these are not men but they're something else uh, but again that's not hard to, uh, to understand it's open to investigation that's all that's not I'm not particularly interested and I don't think that it matters to, uh, to people but the best I can do is try and tell you that again it's not an unreasonable thing there's all kinds of room for this idea uh, well I get too far off the subject but I have told you more about it somebody uh, sent a question here so uh, let me mention this um, I want to know if I talk to Christian groups here. Uh, I guess there's no specific arrangement, although anybody is welcome. Uh, they're saying, what would you suggest it could be said to a Christian who rejects the Quran by quoting the last part of... Actually, it's about the third last sentence in the Bible, which says uh, something like this, whoever adds to this book uh, will be punished. Whoever takes from this book will be punished. See, a lot of people will tell you, this is the part in the Bible where it says the Bible's finished. There's no more revelation. You can't take from this, you can't add to this. Funny thing is, if you ask somebody who tells you that, in which book of the Bible do you find that? See, there are 66 books in the Bible. You find that in book number 66, it's almost the last sentence in the Bible. So they say, you see, here's where it says, this book, don't add to it, don't take from it. But that book is called the Apocalypse, or sometimes the book of Revelation, one of 66 books. Now ask the person who told you that, when was this book written? Was it the last book written in the Bible? Maybe they won't know, but if they go and look it up, they find out it wasn't. There were three more written after that. They are put in the Bible ahead of that book. First, second, and third John, three short letters of John, were written at least two years after the book of Revelation. So you want to ask them, well, if this book says don't add to it, how'd these get in here in front of it? They were written later. And that's where they have to be more honest with you to say, well, when it says don't add to this book, it doesn't mean the Bible. It means this book, Revelation, this last one, number 66. Don't add to it, don't take from it. And that's, that's all it ever meant, of course. It's just been by carelessness that the books are not arranged in the order in which they were written. So one book which says this book is finished has been made the last book of the Bible. So when you read that sentence, you think it's talking about the whole book. It's not. It's talking about itself. Okay, I hope that's clear. They can check that out anywhere they like. Uh, look in uh, any church source. We'll tell them the book of Revelation was not the last one written. So if it says it's finished, you, they have a real problem. Any more questions? Please come up. Please come up here. Okay. She <laughs> must be punished and that is the word forgive. So I want to know whether there is a conditional forgiveness, conditional about repentance in the uh, Yes, I wasn't saying anything myself about what I believed. I was trying to point out that people try to take both positions. They will tell you sin must be punished and they will tell you God forgives. And so when you say, well, which does he do? Does he punish or does he forgive? And they tell you he does both. That's where you have to say, but you can't do both. From the Muslim point of view, it's simply a matter of every sin must be punished unless it's forgiven. You see, so if it's forgiven, it isn't punished. But every sin comes into one of these categories. It is either paid for or it is forgiven all of the accounts are, are set straight. That's, the, uh, that's a, a concept that's not easy to understand to uh, many religious, uh, religions because they think of sin as though it's a condition 
that describes you totally. Whether you do one sin or a thousand sins, that doesn't matter. You're a sinner. So you either are punished or forgiven. And the Muslim says, no, it doesn't work like that. It works the same way as the legal system works. You get punished for what you did, unless you get forgiven. You see, their, their problem is, is that if you are a sinner, you all have the same punishment. It take uh, somebody who used to talk nasty to his grandmother and somebody who killed hundreds of people and say, well, they're all sinners. Same punishment. See, but that's not even how we work it in court. You don't bring a man and say, now you went through a red light and you killed your mother. You're both sentenced to die. You see, <laughs> the, the punishment fits the crime unless there is forgiveness. And then there's no punishment. You see, the, the, the problem is there, not, not the Muslim. The Muslim has a nice... Balance. Here's a list of the things I did wrong. I either pay for them or I get forgiven. Some may be forgiven, some I may have to pay for, but it's one or the other in every case. Their problem is they lump them all together as one, one sum. It's not that I have a long list of sins, it's I have one big sin. My whole life is a sin. I have to pay for it, uh, but I'll be forgiven. But I have to pay. And round and round they go. Or somebody had to pay. So Jesus paid, but God forgives. There's another question on here. Sir. Could you give a clear example of a deletion, addition, or alteration in the Bible? Uh, yes, there's, <laughs> there's many, many, many of those. Uh, the problem is they come in different categories, and if you pick one somebody will escape that and go to somebody, some other category and they'll lead you off the track. I suggest maybe as an example, everybody knows the story in the Bible. It's, you find it in the book of uh, Matthew and in the book of Luke where it says that the devil came and tempted Jesus. And in the book of Matthew it says the devil said to Jesus, uh, he said, uh, turn these stones into bread. Do a, do a trick for me. And then he said, um, uh, throw yourself off the roof and see if God sends an angel to catch you before you hit the ground. And then he said, uh, if you worship me, I'll make you the king of the world. I'll give you the, the whole world. That's in the book of Matthew, I believe it's told in that order. In the book of Luke, it tells the same story, but it's in a different order. He said, first he said, turn the, breads into, turn the bread, uh, rocks into sto- bread. And then he said, uh, worship me. And then he said, uh, throw yourself off the roof, see if an angel catches you. So which way did it happen? Was it one, two, three, or one, three, two? So you have two men telling the same story, but they put it in a different order. It's obvious it's the same story, different order. Now this leads people into you know, quite a digression. They may say, uh, well, you see, Luke told everything with accuracy. So whenever Matthew disagrees with Luke, we take Luke. That's an interesting idea. It doesn't change the fact that apparently this other man wrote something, but he didn't tell it the way it happened. He told it different than the way it happened. At least one of them did that. So they say, we trust Luke. You can take them also to where it then tells you about... uh, uh, Well, I can give you all the references. Their problem is they have have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three stories of the life of Jesus. Matthew and Luke disagree. So they say, well, you take Luke. He began his gospel by saying, I wrote everything with accuracy. Luke disagrees with Mark. And they tell you, well, you take Luke. Because Luke wrote everything with accuracy. But now we have a problem. Because there's places where Matthew and Mark disagree and Luke doesn't say anything. So which one of them is right? Luke is supposed to be the corrector. But he just makes no comment on in various parts. Maybe an easier one. <laughs> in the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 5, it gives you a long list of names in this chapter of people and how many sons they had. In Ezra, chapter 2, verse 5, it mentions a certain man by the name of Ara and how many sons he had. I believe it's 775. In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7, verse 10, is the same long list of men and how many sons they had. When it gets to Ara, it says he had 652 sons. You see, so... Was it 775 or 652? Or neither one of those? Uh, 
a Christian prince plays a lot of emphasis on it. But I noticed that it doesn't appear in any of the early copies of the Bible, right? Trinity? Yes. It doesn't appear in any copy of the Bible uh, till now. Uh, that's not a, a, a thing that the uh, at least the, the sensible Christian community is going to dispute with you that they're well aware of the fact that Trinity is not in the Bible uh, the word isn't there and, and the, the vocabulary isn't there uh, so what they do is find what seems to tell them it might be true this is like that thing I said you can always find something that makes it look like you might be right and so I said, if the moon is made of cheese, I can tell you it's the same color. Looks like I might be right. You can do that with the Bible. If you say Jesus is God, you can find some things that look like you might be right. You can find a place where he's reported to have said, who honors me honors God. Sounds like maybe he's saying he's God. But maybe not. The Quran says, who is uh, loyal to the messenger is loyal to Allah doesn't mean they're the same person in the same sense neither does it necessarily mean that Jesus says who honors me honors God means I am God but it might be so you use that so you take what looks like it might help you and that's the closest you can come to trying to defend that idea okay come Uh, you mentioned about uh, Musaki, you know, which, uh, yeah. and uh, guidance maybe uh, about, about only by the Musaki. I think that's true. Uh, the following verses is uh, about to say who the Musaki are. And my question is, uh, what is the position of uh, non-Muslims? Whether uh, the book is not a book of guidance for the non-Muslims? How are they going to get into the Quran? Yeah, no, the book doesn't say it's a book for Muslims. <laughs> it's just for the Mutakin. Yeah, but there's, there's a lot of people to talk with. They, they never heard of Islam. Uh, where do you draw the difference? Who are the Muslims and who are Muslims? Yes, well, <laughs> both of them are a description of a, of a state of affairs. Muslims not a label you wear or a badge or something. It's supposed to describe you. You have an, an ayah which says, uh, it talks about some people who, uh, Islam was explained to them and their comment was, oh, we were Muslims before this. You see, they didn't call it Islam, they didn't say we're Muslims, but when somebody said, well, Islam is like this, they said, oh, well, then we're Muslims. <laughs> we have been. Before I talked to you, I was a Muslim. You see, that's, uh, that's the point. So that, I know there are people who say, you shouldn't give the Quran to anyone except a Muslim. How do you know? <laughs> you see? Uh, who's a Muslim that's supposed to describe him what he's like doesn't mean what he calls himself maybe he's never heard the word that's uh, tell you a lot of stories that way there's a man that I met who had a cousin going to school in uh, Germany in Stuttgart and they had a, an Islamic center on the campus and there was an old man that came by there and talked to them three different occasions and uh, you know a local man and uh, he was taken to hospital sometime they didn't see him and, and he was told he's dying he'd be dead in a few hours his family sent for the priest and he heard them saying this in his hospital room he said uh, don't bring the priest he says you go to such and such a place you'll find some young men there bring them and they went and they found among them was this man's cousin this friend of mine they came to his hospital room he says you're my witnesses I accept this land what do I say he made the shahada and he died. Now, it isn't really accurate to say he became a Muslim the day he died. He, he might have been a Muslim for 50 years before that. But he never heard of Islam. He knows what Islam is. He knows what submission is. He has taqwa and all of this. But when he met his first contact with Islam, it showed him, this is what Islam is. He says, ah, this is me. <laughs> I've been a Muslim <laughs> all this time, you see. And then he simply makes it public that's all he's saying you're my witness <laughs> which is proper that's not the magic word there is a full of thought that uh, you shouldn't give the Quran to non-Muslims and it yes. is uh, to be understood only by the Musaqib 
so the layman shouldn't go to the bathroom. <laughs> yes, well, as a strange point of view, as I said, if you give somebody the Quran, probably you're giving him a translation anyway. So it doesn't really matter what he does with it. It's not the Quran. Probably it's the translation. But besides that, if somebody wants to insist that you can't give the Quran to somebody, uh, they're not really aware of the history of it. In fact, uh, Ahmed Didad ran into this problem when, uh, with somebody who said uh, to him, so you can't give the Quran to a non-Muslim. He says, how about a piece of it? He says, no, no, not a piece. Is it one verse, one ayah? No, no. Can't give any of it. So then he reminded him of how the Prophet sent letters to the non-Muslim kings and quoted the Quran. He put ayah, an ayah in the letter. Now the messengers didn't come to these kings and say, Do you have wudu before I give you this letter? I have a letter for you. One man took it and he sat on it. He was, you know, in contempt. Now if somebody tries to tell you, Oh, but later there was a verse revealed which said, None shall touch it but those who are clean and so on. They don't know what they're talking about. That's a Meccan verse, not a Medinan verse. The letters were sent from Medina. That ayah was revealed in Mecca long before that time. The meaning of that verse is, uh, well, that's another subject, but it's not this simple situation of saying, no, unless this is a man who, he comes to the Juma every Friday, he can't touch the Quran. It's a little more complex than that. I don't want to really go into it, but you, you don't just chop it off like that. There's it, much more to it than that. I mean, for that matter, who, who were the Muslims to start with? What made the Muslims was the revelation, as they heard it piece by piece. They didn't become Muslims and then said, do you have a revelation that I can touch? You see, they, it was a revelation that won them over. That's the way it's supposed to work even now. But again, it's, it's an imaginary problem usually because you're, you're not giving somebody an Arabic copy anyway. Now, I guess that's all our time.